Dixon. Today is Monday, April 15, 1996. We're at Miles College. My name is Dr. Horace Huntley. Ms. Dixon, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and sit and talk with us today about the Civil Rights Movement. I'm happy to be here, Dr. Huntley. I want to just start by getting some general information about your background. Tell me just a bit about your parents. Were your parents from Alabama? Yes, uh, my mother was born in Hopewell, Alabama, a few miles outside of uh, Montgomery. My father was born in Lowndes County uh, over in, uh, uh, for deposit. Uh, they each of them migrated to Montgomery, and uh, there, there they got married in Montgomery, Alabama. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have now uh, one sister and uh, three brothers. There were six of us. I had one sister who is older who died in infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, there were six of us, one sister older, mm -hmm. uh, I have a brother older than I am, and then I have a, a sister younger than I am, and two brothers younger. Okay, so you were third? I was third, out the, yes. Out of the seven? Okay. Out of the six. Out of the six? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, your, your parents then, you then were born in? Where? In Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery. Uh, did you start school in Montgomery? Uh, I, was, we, I was born, as I said, born in Montgomery and started school early in Montgomery. Started uh, at kindergarten, and, uh, Catholic kindergarten, and left there and went to Loveless School. Uh, if, if you may remember, you may not remember, in Montgomery, we lived on the west side of town, and Montgomery uh, had few schools at that time. Uh, Mr. Loveless was an undertaker. Uh, and they built a school on the west side, and they named it Loveless School, and it went from elementary through high school. Loveless was a black undertaker? Yes, Mr. Loveless was a under black undertaker in mm -hmm. Montgomery, and so they named this school on the west side after uh, Mr. Loveless. What kind of work did your, your parents do? Well, my mother uh, worked in the white folks' house, as they say, and my father worked at a sawmill, I mean, at a a uh, cotton mill in Montgomery, and uh, he died rather young. He caught at the what they call eight day pneumonia. Uh, back then, if you caught the pneumonia, it, they didn't have all this penicillin and all this other stuff that they used to, uh, to, to 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 get the fever down. And and if you if you made it through the eighth day, you would live. If you didn't, you died. So finally, of course, now they've got that under control. But he died in 1938. And how old were you when he died? Six. <clears throat> no, and I was maybe, I was born in 1933. Okay. So I was five. All right. And your mother then raised you and your... Ra my mother raised me and my older brother and, the, and my other two brothers and sister by herself here in and Birmingham. you said she was domestic. Well, let, yes, let, let me, once when my father died, uh, um, right immediately somewhat following that, my mother's sister died. She had four children. Uh, her husband had died with tuberculosis. Uh, black folk at that, that time weren't getting the, the necessary health, the, necessary, uh, the requisite health care that they needed. So my mother had her five children, because my youngest brother was born June of the month. My daddy died in May. My brother was born in June of 1938. So when my mother's sister died uh, about nine months later, uh, my mother's oldest sister who lives here, who was living here in Birmingham, uh, came back to Montgomery. And because my mother only had a brother, Glover, Pain, my Uncle Glover living there. She decided that my mother was, was, was she was really the youngest of, 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 the, of that part of the family. 
And she said, that, uh, Rachel, you can't take care of these children, so you're nothing but a child yourself. So she brought her back, brought all of us back to Birmingham, out to Fairfield, <clears throat> to live with her and her husband and one child. I see. So you, had, <clears throat> you were living with your aunt and uncle and when we mother, first when you first came, came to, to Birmingham. Birmingham. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and you moved to, to Fairfield. Yes, sir. And did your mother then find employment immediately? Well, it, it wasn't hard uh, then to find employment because uh, if you could, if you could uh, clean up a house, if you could wash, iron, cook, and sew, you could get a job. I, I remember my mother having three or, two or three different jobs. Uh, to, that what we, my father, when he died, we didn't qualify for uh, Social Security. Because as you, if you can remember, the Social Security uh, uh, law was just really coming in into effect. Uh, welfare was pe just unthinkable. People, black people, didn't want you to give them anything. Uh, they didn't call it, they, didn't, they had another name for it. They didn't call it welfare, they had another name for it. But uh, people just didn't want you to give them anything. Mm -hmm. So they, they would work, work in a number of jobs. Because I mean, you, you may remember yourself, that you cannot, at back in this time, go to anybody else's house and eat. If, they, if you ate in somebody's house and your parents find out about it, uh, I don't care how hungry, how hungry you were, you had to refuse. But if they find out about it, then you had a record in coming. You had to answer to it. You them. had to answer to it. That's them. right. Right. As a child, what do you remember most about growing up in Fairfield? Well, those first days of coming to Birmingham. Well, w one of the things uh, I guess all children uh, grapple with is how do you relate to other children around you? I can remember uh, uh, our trying to associate with the other children around us, and, and uh, we were from Montgomery, and Birmingham was the largest city. We were from the country. Uh, and Birmingham, I mean, Montgomery was more urban than, <laughs> than Birmingham was. So I, I guess the early part of it was trying to associate and, and, and develop new friendships with, with the younger people in, in, the, uh, in the community there. My uh, uncle and aunt, they were, they were kind of protective. They didn't, they didn't want us to go out of the yard because they, uh, they knew we were, we were new in the, in, in the city and, and they didn't know how we would mix in with people. But I think that's, the, uh, that's in the very early part of it that uh, uh, I remember that uh, as being a, a problem. But I think one of the most distressing things was, to me was, as a youngster, I was in the third grade uh, when, when I left Montgomery. Uh, I had gotten skipped because uh, uh, my brother was, my oldest brother was a good teacher and he taught uh, me well my ABCs and I could read and I got skipped. But when we got to Birmingham, uh, they put us back a grade and that, and that I, I just couldn't understand uh, why, why they would do that, but that was a thing that they was doing with just about everybody. With anyone coming from so, a smaller school system, they normally would put them back. Yes. Yeah, just yeah. as when, when, when we would go to North, yes. if you're from Alabama, you <clears throat> obviously would be put back. Be put back a grade, and I, I, I never understood that to this day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I don't think it, it didn't do anything, I don't think, to, to, to hurt me. It was kind of tough. You mentioned that you started school, you went to a Catholic school. When you came to Birmingham, did you remain in a Catholic school? No, <clears throat> in Montgomery, uh, we we went when we left the Catholic school. That was kindergarten. Oh, okay. And then and we moved from kindergarten to to Lovelace. Right. And then when we got here to Birmingham, we uh, we we went to Sixty First Street School, which is now Robinson Elementary School. Uh, it was uh, it was a, a good school. Uh, the teachers were very interest, interested in, in the students. Miss Robinson was uh, was uh, was an older lady, and and it was it was really a, you had strict discipline there. You you didn't play around any. You had to get your lesson. Uh, I guess one of the most memorable things that I can remember about uh, then was uh, my mother had to go to yeah everybody rode the bus. Nobody had a car, so my mother would had to be over the mountain uh, to serve breakfast. I, for the, for the people she worked for over there, which meant she had to get up early. She would get up and they would cook. And my oldest brother would see to it that we would have food to eat. 
And and we had to, when Mama come back, the dishes and everything had to be clean. So we had to wash these dishes before we left, get the other children ready to go to school. So as a consequence, I would be late every morning. And I never forget George Arbor's mother uh, taught me in the fifth grade, Ms. job I was going to school and, and I got there crying that morning. Ms. Yarbrough said, Pat came to the desk and patted me on the back and told me, said, said uh, son, said, just get here. Just get here. And I never forgot that. Uh, uh, Dick Arrington was in our fourth grade class. I remember distinctly, uh, this was Ms. Williams' class. And uh, uh, Arrington was always uh, uh, just the way you see him. Now, that's the way he was when he was a little boy, always erudite and moving on. So they skipped him. So he went to Ms. Glenn's class and left us back there in the, in the, in the, uh, in, 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 with Ms. Williams in, 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 in fourth grade. Uh, so I guess we started with him uh, in Ms. Woodruff's class in the third grade. But when we got to uh, Ms. Williams, he went on by. Yeah, yeah. So your, those days, those early days at Robinson on 61st Street were, were very memorable days. Uh, what, how, what was the transition like, though, from Robinson to... Uh, Fairfield next, Industrial High? Yes. Well, even before we left, before I left... Uh, Fairfield Robinson Elementary, I got one of the best lessons of my life. Uh, we would have spelling matches within the, in the uh, school, the seventh grader, this, this section, that section. Mm -hmm. And one day, I intentionally sat down and wouldn't spell the word. So I thought I was smart. I thought I was not, not smart here, mm -hmm. but just frolicking and going to try to show uh, the teacher what I was going to do. So we, our class lost the spelling bee, lost the match. Because you wouldn't. Because I wouldn't, 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 I was clearly the best speller, and I wouldn't do it. Um, uh, so when we got back Why over the Why did you decide to do that? Just, just devilish, just, okay. just, just going to be smart, not a team player. They couldn't, well, couldn't win without you. Couldn't win without me, and I, and I, and I just you showed, I showed them that they couldn't win without me. Which was was showed that I really was the team player, uh, and 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 it didn't make sense. So I looked at Miss Moore when I sat down. She she just. When I got back, when we got back, they were on this side of the of the building, Robson. We were on the other side. When I got back over there, she said, "Joe Nathan, come back. I want to see you. I want to, I want to see you. I want to you." She called a word out to me, and I spelled it, and she took that strap. And she beat me and, I, and told me one thing that I've never forgotten. She said, you take too much for granted. You play too much. Do not take things for granted. You got to get serious about yourself. I've never forgotten that. You've been serious. I've, I've been serious. I've been on business. Because I guess the strap got me on business. <laughs> but I've, been, I've been serious ever since then. Right. What was the transition like from, from Robinson to, to uh, Fairfield Industrial? Well, you know, you're anxious to get to high school. You're going to the eighth grade. And, uh, you, you're very anxious to get there. You want to be with, with you think you, you, you're a big boy oh, yeah. and, and everything. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. Uh, for me, uh, I wanted to uh, to go to high school, uh, but I had this proclivity to to be just to try to be to do. Not I wasn't a bad kid. I don't think that I look at it, but I would take up other folks' burden and get into trouble. And uh, what, I guess the thing that saved me was the fact that I had to get my lesson. Uh, they, in Fairfield, you had to get your lesson. What kind of issues would you take up? That if somebody was fighting Horace, they would come get me, the, 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 the fight for him. If somebody was fighting my brother, they'd come get me. If my brother wouldn't fight, I'd get mad and fight. You know, I, I, had, a, I had just a, I, I, when I look back at it, I think I had a, a chip on my shoulder because I guess it might have been because I was mad because my father was dead or my, my mother could then put in the in the time and uh and uh I thought that uh uh somebody would, would you know back then you had the, the high yellows and the and the, and the black ones and all this other stuff and I you I, you think people were picking on you it was just 
it was just a situation where I was uh, not mature and didn't understand what was going on. And I was, I was really a strong, I, I could wrestle anybody. I could, uh, I could, I, I was just the guy that you'd come to get to, uh, to solve, <laughs> to solve the problem. <laughs> so somebody told me, when they, once they saw me, they said, if you were in New York, you'd probably get a job with the mafiosi <laughs> for what you try to do. Yeah. But I guess it was just a confused youngster. Uh, I guess, this, and I was about to tell you the thing I think that saved me, that teachers took a lot of interest in me. My teachers that I had took a lot of, the fact that Mrs. Uh, Moore uh, uh, took that time out with me to tell me about not taking so much for granted, that was a blessing. And then when I got uh, over in, in, in high school, I was always the leader of the class. I was the president of my class from the time I was in the first grade till I was a junior in college. I was the president of my class. Even when you were in Arrington's class? Yes, yes. Uh, Mac Ferguson, all of the rest. The kids like me. They like me. I guess I don't know why, but I could get along with people. And I, you know, then I was a paper boy. I, uh, while I was uh, 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 going to the fifth grade, and all, I had a job. I fed the hogs in, in, uh, uh, in the morning before I left, and I fed them in the evening when I came back. And uh, I started uh, throwing papers when I was uh, uh, in, in, the, in maybe the Sixth, seventh grade, Mr. Burke's. What paper? Uh, Birmingham Post Herald, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Burke had the right route for the for the Post Herald. Uh, it was the Age Herald before the Post Herald, mm -hmm. and I worked for Mr. Burke, and then you work for Mr. Burke, and then you graduate to uh, working as a news carrier. You sell the Afro American, you sell the uh, the uh, Pittsburgh Courier, you sell the, the New York Amsterdam News, the Birmingham World, the Birmingham Mirror. And uh, you make two pennies, and you were independent. You had money. You, you know, you didn't, you didn't uh, have any problems uh, then because I was, I was making money. But what I did with the money I made, I always had to take mine home because my mama needed it. So you were helping really to support, <coughs> support the, family. the family and myself. Mm -hmm. My brother, uh, Robert, my oldest brother, worked uh, down at Brady's Tobacco Store and. Uh, he, we set up pins, set up pins in the bowling alley, and then as I tell you when I graduated to the to the to the, the white folk paper, uh, then I began to work with Wilbur Hughes and Edwin Hicks, and Wil Wilbur had the largest route, and Edwin had the next large route, and Wilbur would put the papers together, you know, the paper, the paper would come out, the, the the social section and the other sections would come out in the middle of the week, so you put the the, the funny. In with the with the parade magazine, and then you put the put that together. Then you put the fun in the parade magazine in the social section. And then at twelve o'clock, a little bit after twelve o'clock on Saturday night, Saturday Sunday morning, the newspaper would come in, and then we put that together. So when 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 uh, when 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 we got to the uh, to the by the, by the ninth grade, Wilbur had gradu was graduating from high school, and then that meant that uh, I was a big man in Fairfield Inn because I had that big paper route. So I hired my brother and I hired other people along the way to help me to uh, sell the paper. And, and I got to be known by I was popular. I guess it's not wasn't so much that I was smart, but people knew me and liked me, and they, and they would uh, vote for me. Uh, I guess uh, and while I was in high school, I, I, I just couldn't, I, some of the me, I just couldn't get adjusted. So finally, in 11th grade, uh, we got, I got into trouble and I got suspended. By the end of the school year, I got suspended, and I was elected president of the senior class while I was suspended from school. So Mr. <laughs> so Oliver called me uh, to, to come back, and he did something for me that had stuck with me, and I'd use it with my family. He made me come across the stage, sit down in the assembly, and apologize to all of the students at Fairfield, Fairfield Industrial High School for my behavior and the way I was at. Me and Robert Lee Taylor, Robert Lee Taylor died in New York, but Robert Lee was on the football team and he left and went over to Westfield and they found out what was going on, so they put him out of school. So Mr. Oliver had Robert Taylor and myself sitting on that stage and made us apologize to the student body for what we were doing. But I guess the other thing that, that kept me all right in school was uh, I made the honor roll. I made the honor roll every six weeks. And the, only, and the reason I made the honor roll 
was my oldest brother was making was on the was on the honor roll that way. And Mr. Oliver would parade us across the the the, 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 the stage in front of everybody and he'd say, uh, uh Joe Dixon, honor roll, junior three C, second six weeks, says maintain, he'd tell how long he'd been on honor roll. So I said to myself, I said, I'm not gonna let my brother beat me. Uh, and that is why today I am against magnet schools, I'm against this separating these students because you take away the competition. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when I was in school, whoever was the smartest had the, the, this seat, and the next smartest had that seat, and everybody was there trying to out do, outsmart the other one and get the lesson so that you, know, you could really be recognized in, in, in the community. So uh, that was, I guess, the thing that saved me, the fact that I would make the honor roll and, and uh, every time the man put you out of school, you got to bring your mama back. He, he, you get the punishment from him before you leave. Mm -hmm. And then if your mama can't go to the white folks' house and what? Mm -hmm. And all the time, she tell you, so, boy, you know, I, I just can't. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, said, But, you know, I'm gonna, come on, let's go on up there. Yeah. We got to do it. I was going to ask you, what, um, what, what would you say was the impact of Professor Oliver? on children that came through Fairfield Industrial High School? I think E.J. Oliver probably was, was the best educator in the state of Alabama since Booker T. Washington. Now, of course, there were a number of people uh, during that time could hold a candle to him. And I think the thing that made uh, Mr. Oliver such a great educator was he adopted the principles of Booker T. Washington. And that is you got to learn how to do something with your hands as well as your head. Your head as well as your hands. When you finished Fairfield Industrial High School, you could go on to college and could compete. You could also go out into the job market and get a job. Mr. Oliver challenged us to reach for the top. One of his sayings was, there's room at the top, there's room at the top. You know why, you know why? There's so many everybody on the bottom, everybody on the bottom. Well, you gotta reach for the top, you gotta reach for the top. You gotta reach for the stars, reach for the stars. And he, and he pushed it, and he pushed it, and he preached it. Then he put it in the Hall of Fame. Long before anybody had the Hall of Fame, Mr. Oliver had the Hall of Fame, where he was showing where people who had gone to Fairfield Industrial High School had achieved and were making their name uh, uh, and presence felt in the community. So in my book, uh, he was an ultimate educator. Also, he did something that uh, a number of other principals were doing. Mr. Oliver made sure that we knew something about ourselves as a people. Before you finished Fairfield Industrial High School, you had to read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. You had to outline it. Then that meant that you knew that if you went out on a job, you did it like Booker T. Washington did it. You do it to perfection, and when you wipe the white handkerchief across it, then you pick up no dust. You mean it was a requirement? It was a requirement. That every Every senior, student, every senior that left Fairfield Industrial High School had to read and outline up from slavery. We had Carter G. Woodson's book there. Which one? Miseducation? Uh -uh. Negro history. Negro history. We had his book. We took, that was a requirement. And later on, uh, after I had gotten out of law school and was walking through the alley one day, Mr. 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 Oliver was coming. He said, boy, hey, wait a minute, boy, wait a minute. He stopped me. He said, I'm proud of you. He said, I always knew you had it in there. I just didn't know how to get it out of you. He said, I'm proud of you. He said, I never thought that you'd gone this far as you've gone, I said, well, I got one question to ask you. I said, how did you get Negro history taught in the school? He said, when I went and took the, when I took the job at Fairfield, I made a deal with the, with the, with the superintendent of school, Mr. Baker. I asked him, could I do it? Could I teach it? He said, no, you can't do it. He said, they don't allow you to teach it. He said, but if I don't teach it, if I don't teach Negro history, if I don't give these people 
uh, op the opportunity to know something about themselves, then we're lost. He said, I need the cooperation of the, the preacher. I need the cooperation of the families because these people were coming from the, from the farms, the work in these plants and mines. He said they, were, they, were, they, they didn't even know what was going on. So he needed the cooperation. And he had to teach us something about ourselves. And he said that the man told him, go ahead and teach it. If they catch you, I swear I didn't tell you to do it. So he did it. He did it. And words, it paid off. It's a rather courageous move then for him it, to, it paid to take off. it on his take it on the, take it on himself mm -hmm. to do it. After high school, Joe, what did you do? After high school, I got a job at Vulcan Furniture Manufacturer. Spot welding chairs for making dinette suits. I worked there from the time I got out of high school. I got out of high school in 1953, 1952. Should have gotten out in 1951, but I got out in 1952. And uh, me, I went to summer school every summer. Mr. Alvarez, I didn't know how to act. He made me go to summer school every summer to learn how to act. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I was drafted from Vulcan Furniture Manufacturer in 1953, uh, in June of 53 and went to, uh, that was a career during the Korean War, and went to uh, uh, Fort Jackson, and from Fort Jackson back to Camp Rucker. And by the time we got to Camp Rucker, they had called a truce, uh, and, uh, and they pulled back to the 38th parallel, and I guess Mama had prayed real hard <laughs> that, 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 I, that we didn't have to go and, and fight over there. And uh, I stayed in the Army for two years and, uh, and was discharged and came back home. So you came back home in 55? 55, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. What did you do then? Started much of the same thing that I was doing, uh, running around with the fellas and, and uh, the little money that I, I had saved, 18 bonds, one for every month. Mama had saved a little bit of that, and uh, they paid me the money that I got. And so uh, I got a, Nate Reed got me a job up at uh, Lord Nolan. He was a cook. Walter Cook was the head cook. And uh, Nay Reed was, a, was the, uh, next to the head. He was going to get Walter's job. So Nay said, come on, Joe, I'm going to get you the job. I'm going to make you a pot wash. You know how to wash pots. Uh, you wash them in the arm, and you'll be a good pot wash. So he talked to the lady, and the lady gave me the job. And I went up there and, uh, and, and, and worked in the, in the kitchen up there at Lord Nolan Hospital. Uh -huh. And all the while I was up there, my mama would ask, would ask me, what was I going to do? I said, nothing. I said, you know, I'm working. I got, I'm up at Lord Nolan. So it was getting close to uh, September and time to go to, go to start at Miles. So she asked me again. She said, boy, I say, you, you going to school? I said, Mama, I got a job. See, I had already argued with her and told, told her I didn't need her to keep my money. I was grown. I had been in the Army. I don't need you to keep my money. I'm a man, you know. And so she said, well, you going to school, boy? I said, Mama, I got a job. I'm, I'm working now. I'm, I'm working in the Lord Nolan. She said, boy, I might, you, you going to school? She said, you finished high school? And she said, I couldn't go. I didn't get to go to school. So you need to go to school. I said, Mom, I don't, I don't I got a job. She said, I don't know. She said, boy. I said, Mom, I'm, I, I, I don't go to school. I went on the way. The next day, she asked me, she said, boy, you going to school? Getting closer and closer. You know what the problem was? The problem was I had spent that money and uh, having spent the money, I didn't have no money to go to school with. Naturally, she had told me, but you know, let me tell you what she did. She, told, she said this to me, and I'll never forget as long as I'm black. She said, they tell me that if you've been in the Army, Uncle Sam will pay your way to school. And she said, I didn't get a chance to go to school, boy, and you didn't finish school. How far did she go in school? Did you know? Maybe the fifth grade or someone in the fifth. And your father? Same. Same. Yeah. Uh, she said, uh, if you don't go to school and somebody pay your way, boy, you ain't got much sense as I thought you had. And that killed me. I came out here and I found out. Out here, man. Out the miles, yeah. I was living right, right across the street there in the project right there, up in the hill up there, 5116 Avenue G. I came out and... Uh, it was $68 off, $58 a quarter. I had spent all of the money. I went back, and I didn't say nothing. So Mom said, boy, you going to school? Then finally I had to give in. I said, Mama, I said, I ain't got no money. 
She said, you ain't got no money? I said, no, ma'am. I said, she said, what you do with the, what you do with the money? She knew that dollar. She didn't want to hear from me. I said, well, we, I, we spent, I spent it. She said, well, go back out there and see how much it costs. I went back out there and they said, $58. My mama gave me two $50 bills that she had tied up in a handkerchief. I mean, in a stocking. I came out there and I paid to get in school at Miles. Then she gave me the money to buy my first books with. But that was an agonizing thing for me, for me to have to be one pushed to go to school. And I was the leader in the class. I was a, Joseph McPherson was a volunteer, and I was a little toy in the class. Uh, that was one agonizing moment for me. So I came to Miles. And, and uh, graduated. Uh, were you were you active in the student body while you were yes, here? Yes, yes. We were pre made, I came out and immediately became president of the, the, the freshman class, the largest pre freshman class they ever had. I became president and uh, became very active. Uh, we did fa we did fashion shows. We did uh, a number of things to raise money to help the school. There was a, a tremendous school spirit during that time. Uh, you had this was the time when the veterans were coming back uh, from from the Korean War, and uh, more women were coming to school. Uh, people, our people, were, were really into it because this was right following Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, this was we, this was also just after the NACP was outlawed from being operating in the state of Alabama. The Alabama Christian Movement had been organized in 56. So between 56 and 63, there was some organizing going on in Birmingham. Were, were, were the students from Miles yes, and let, yourself let, involved? I, I see. Let, me, let me say what happened. The Alphas, now this is, this is, this is a strange one here. We were attempting to get all, all of the fraternities on the campus here and sorority, bringing the sororities too. So we, we brought in, they brought, we're bringing in Cecil B. King was, our, was, our, was a, one of the teachers here, and he brought in, he was a Kappa, and brought Kappa, and I had pledged with the Alphas. So they went to the Alphas and talked to the Alphas and said, look, we need to bring this other uh, uh, fraternity on the campus. Uh, we want to get it started. And they allowed me to leave the Alphas and go <laughs> to the campus. And we are... Uh, 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 Wait a minute. Well, you're, you're saying that you were, you were alpha. I played as alpha first. I did uh, I did I, I was in the Sphinx Club with the alphas first. Yeah. And then when 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 it was determined that we were going to bring the campus onto the campus, uh, I got they released me in order that I could be a member of the of. The <laughs> so you are you are Kappa Alpha. That that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 real strange. But we put it together, and I became uh, president of the Scrollers Club, and then eventually I was a uh, uh, pole mark of the, uh, the chapter here. Uh, and all during that time, the Alphas were really in the lead because they had been there for some time. Dean Pearson and uh, the, those, those men who were, Alpha men who were here, they decided that we were going to get people registered to vote. So we started going down to the courthouse to get people registered to vote. And what happened was we, read, we met with all kind of obstacles. You got to read this, these obstacles they put in front of us. Well, that's superficial. Mm -hmm. You had to be able to read and interpret and tell who, who was the president and who were the congressmen and, and who was this and who was that. You know, it was very subjective. And a lot of, lot of, lot of our people were, were disillusioned by the fact that they didn't know, um, that, that, that some of the things they didn't know that they were required, requiring of us. Uh, and, uh, but we did managed to become very successful in our effort to get blacks registered to vote. Do you remember when you registered to vote yourself? Yeah. Did and you not, have any, any difficulty? Well, I had to do the same thing everybody else did. I had to, I had to answer, we had to answer the questions about who was the, who the senators, who was the, who was, who was, how many members of the House of Representatives we have, uh, and all of that. I, I did it because I'm, um, I've heard that there have been questions like how many bubbles in a bottle. How many bu soap? Yeah, bubbles in a bottle. Yeah, these, these kind of things. Many, and I think one of the things was uh, at that time, I wasn't quite as mean as I am now or uh, 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 grew into be when, in dealing with, with people because that was something that was 
important to me because I had, we had good civics teachers at Fairfield Industrial High School, Ms. Cook uh, and, 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 and those folks. They, they drilled it in you and they made you read the newspapers so you would know what was going on. So as a consequence, we, we could answer the question fairly, fairly easily. But some of our uh, people that went down with us, and I remember Shaky Collins went down with us, Andrew Collins, and uh, he was, he got so mad by having, by having the answer, he just didn't see no reason. So they, they, they wouldn't let him pass two or three times. A number of people, they just wouldn't let him pass. It was very subjective, you know. But I do remember back in 1955, that's when I registered to vote. Mm -hmm. So these efforts then are all really leading to something, it appears, that because after 19... 60. When did you graduate? You graduated. I graduated in 60. I dropped 60. out twice to go to the hospital, mm -hmm. and, and I graduated in 60. And then what did you do directly after you graduated? Well, let, let me tell you what we did while we, while we were here. Okay. Uh, we managed to get a number of people registered to vote. We also served as role models to get other kids to, to come in this, come want to go come to college. Uh, we. Jesse Walker, uh, when I got to my junior year, I became vice president of the student council. And Jesse Walker was president of the student council. And uh, this, this meant that I was going to be president of the student council the next year, which to, in our estimation was higher than being president of the class. Uh, we started protesting uh, the situation here in Birmingham. We started uh, complaining about the fact that they had these, these double standards and all the segregation was going on. Jesse Walker was the leader in this effort, and, and Jesse has never been given any credit for what he did. Jesse and myself and the, and the rest of us would go up to Kelly Ingram Park. You couldn't go in it, and we would march around there, protesting what was going on, no hiring of black people, and police officers uh, and, and strict segregation here in Birmingham. This is in 1960? 1955, 56. And you would go to Kelly Ingram Park and you would, you would demonstrate by marching around mm -hmm. the perimeter of the park. The park, because that was a white folk park. You weren't supposed to go in that park. Uh, one day, uh, it, got, it, 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 appears, it appeared that we were going to be out there. So a white detective, I think is, I can't think of his name, but he came to us and told us, look, I want y'all out of this park. He said, we got word that some, some, some Klan people are going to come through here, and they're going to, going, to, going to be shooting and doing some everything. We don't, I don't, we don't want you in the park tonight. Don't be out here. And he pleaded with us. So we went in the A.G. Gaston Motel and met, and we, we met in there. We got back to the campus, what was going on, and uh, Dr. Bell called an assembly. And he told us, he said, young men and young women, you cannot lead demonstrations from out here on this campus. He said, cannot lead demonstrations from out here on this campus because I'm in the business of educating young black people to face the world. And he said, I have to go and raise the money from whites. And whites are not in keeping with what you're doing. He said, you will not lead demonstrations from on this campus. That was one of the reasons we were down, downtown. And he said this, he said, you have to be sure that this is what you want to do. He said, if you have decided that this is what you want to do, even though you, I, we can't sanction you leading from here, you have to understand this, that if you're going to fight, then you're going to have to take responsibility. You're going to have to be prepared to educate your young, take care of your school. You have to be prepared to take care of all of these things. You're not going to be able to ask the white man to do this for you. He said, because young men and young women, you cannot fight and beg too. What now, was the reaction of your student group? We continued. We didn't stop. We didn't, we didn't, 
we didn't lead, we let the, well, the demonstration was, that was led from here got Jesse Walker suspended. He was suspended from the school. And we, when we finally got him back in school, uh, uh, and he graduated. But in the meantime, Mr. Shuttlesworth was, was doing what he was doing over at his church. And Fred sent, I went, started attending the meetings over there, at, at, over at uh, Fred's church over in, uh, in North Birmingham. And Fred told us, you got, this is big. You, 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 you won't be, you need to, you need, your students need to join with us. You need to join in with us in this, in this, in this fight that we have. And so that's the way that happened. Now, this is prior to your leaving Miles, prior to your graduating from Miles, right? Yes. This is as you were, as you matriculating yes. uh, here at Miles. Um, how active then were you? Were there... Because at that time, the movement, they were involved in, in this, the uh, attempt to desegregate Phillips High School. They were involved with the buses, riding the buses, trying to desegregate yeah, the, yeah, the, the, this is, at, When I graduated from Miles, I got a job with the Booker T. Washington Insurance Company selling insurance. Mm -hmm. And that gave me the opportunity to participate more in what was going on. It was an effort that came from outside Alabama, as well as what was going on inside Alabama. And I think the thing that happened with the bombing of Mr. Shelworth, uh, Reverend Shelworth Church, with the beating of the, of the, of the people at the bus station and, and the clans meeting everybody, wherever they, where they stopped, and the, and the meet Mr. Reeve, I think his name was Jane Reeve, they beat him so bad up there. The that put, my pipe that put the spotlight on it. Mm -hmm. So at, at that time, uh, uh, that was happening, uh, stuff was happening kind of simultaneously a lot. Mm -hmm. But when, when, when uh, what started the situation in Birmingham was a doctor, immediately after this, Dr. Bell died and Lucius Pitts became president. Mm -hmm. Lucius understood, Lucius had been in Atlanta and working with the Y. He came from the Y over there. In the interim, in, a little, in, a, in, a, in a, one of those slivers there, I left and went to New York. And when I went to New York, I saw Howard K. Smith on television with Who Speaks for Birmingham. And these, when the he, Who Speaks for Birmingham came on, then I realized that we, went, we were really it was all out. Then I came back. I got sick in New York, and I came back to Birmingham and went back to work for Dr. Guest. And that gave me, I think, again, as I said, the opportunity, I thought, to free to participate. Dr. Pitts organized what was known as a selective buying campaign. I think it was the most effective buying campaign, uh, that, uh, selective buying campaign I've ever seen because nobody was anywhere uh, putting up signs. Nobody uh, was, was screaming from, from anywhere about it. It was a, a method. God had to have been in it. It had to be the work of the Lord because we managed to pull all those people out of the stores and they didn't go downtown to buy. Now this, this is in 1962. You were out of school and you are now working for... Booker T. Washington Insurance Company. Right? Yes. But you also are involved with the Selective Bank. With the struggle. Campaign. Yes, sir. With the Selective Bank. Campaign. My brother, I had a brother, brother, my brother Luther was yet a student out here. Uh, and he was very active in, in, the, uh, in the campaign. And Frank Dukes was an excellent friend of mine. And Frank was, was, was one, of the, one of the true leaders in the, in the struggle. Uh, and so we, we got everybody out of town not buying. Now, that was a task, though. I know, shall I forget, uh, they had GES out on uh, Loma Avenue, and one day... It was GES. It was General, it was General, so G, it was a, something like, it was something like Kmart or something, you buy groceries and all that stuff in there, and, and drugs and stuff. It, right, right there by that ditch, uh, on Loma Avenue, where you, right by Rickwood Field. Okay. I went in there one day, and, and I see this guy, he's down there as clean as a pen, nobody's. Nobody but the white pharmacist, the white 
clerk and, and, and all those other we and we asking these folk, if we spending our money, we want to know why can't our lady women try on the, the hats? Uh, why can't they try on the clothes? Why do you got to have uh, two signs for the water? You got to walk all the way back down to Fourth Avenue from downtown to use the bathroom. Uh, you get on the bus. You gotta, you've got to, uh, you, you got to stand there. You, you, nobody's sitting there. They got the sign. You're on the streetcar, the bus, or the trolley. And we just wanted to know why. And so we felt, uh, Dr. Pitts, well, what you do? What we have to do is we take the money. They, this is what you can do. We, it, it, we don't have any weapons to fight with, but our money. So finally, uh, they agreed to take the signs down. In the store. In the store. Mm -hmm. Man, the white folk took the signs down. <laughs> And we let our people go back downtown. After they got back downtown, they put the sign back up. <laughs> they put them back up. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back at it again. And this is where we had to go into strict surveillance. We had to tell people, say, look, if you go downtown and buy something, we're going we gonna to do something. We, you're going gonna to have to answer to us. And that's where I'm talking about real people were having folks to deliver the clothes to their store. So we put up a watch to see who was having stuff delivered to them. And we and we got, we 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 fronted them as the young folks said out. We fronted them out. Say so you do? you can't you can't you can't uh, buy downtown. We 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 we, we a struggle. We at war with this man. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a nonviolent war. So when when I got an EGES that day, and uh and we had people patrolling to go who see who who's in, who's in, who's buying. And so what we did, Upshaw came out. This time I came out. And said, he said, he said, uh, hey. And I said the same, by the same time, I said, and he said to me, I said, buddy, he said, buddy, we aren't buying in these stores. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I thought you were trying to slip and buy something. Okay. I said, but we together. Okay. I thought he was trying to so buy both something. Of you are, both of us on patrol. We were on patrol. That's right. And that was the way we did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, uh, the, selective, get, the selective ban campaign now, it was successful because it did, uh, Galvanized people. It galvanized this been, people. This is in 1962. The demonstrations that will be known worldwide would come, come in about 63. in 1963. Yes. Where were you doing that I, part? I, I was still, still here in Birmingham. Uh, let me just say this, that uh, Dina Drew, uh, I can't think of Barrett Pelson's wife for his name, and Dr. Pitts had gotten the friends of Miles College together. Marie Jemison, the, the lady over there, the white, white, uh, somebody told Miss Jemison's, uh, Marie's uh, husband that she was there, they said, well, she's crazy. You know? <laughs> she, but she was right here with us trying to help us get, make Birmingham better. And uh, John Drew and all these, these, these people, Pitts was, managed to pull these folks together. And, 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 and he, was, he, was, he was honest and, and he knew all of the answers. When we, when we, see, first, we, before the demonstrations and all this other stuff, we, we met with white folk to try to get them to see that we, we weren't asking for much. We just wanted a little dignity. And, and they told us, it, McPherson, Duke, Shelley Miller, my brother, and I think UW Clemens, and two or three more, they told us, they said, well, you know, uh, nobody's concerned or worried about what's going on here in Birmingham. He said, uh, these niggas satisfied. He said, the Negroes here in Alabama, they're happy. They're singing, they're dancing. Who was this? Who, this, this who was, was, this, this who, was you, who did you meet with? We met with the black, white power structure. Mm -hmm. And they said, nobody dissatisfied but you niggas. And now with you niggas so dissatisfied with Birmingham, we will give you your fare to any city, New York, Chicago, or anywhere you want to go, and give you some money and help you get a job when you get there. And that, didn't, that, was, that was cold. Mm -hmm. That was cold. And now this is in a meeting. Was there a reaction to that? Did you respond? Well, you know, all? we knew what uh, Pitt said. Now, they're going to tell you this. Mm -hmm. And when they tell you this, you tell them this. Mm -hmm. And when they say this, you tell them this. Deuce was the uh, spokesman. He was president of student council. Mm -hmm. Shelley was Shelley Miller was there. And uh, he, they, my brother, UW, and all of them were there. You know, I was, I, was, I was out of school, so, you know, I just had to, you know. And I was slipping over there doing it because I was supposed to be selling insurance. <laughs> you know, right. uh, uh, then the demonstrations came. Did you attend mass meetings? Sure, every, every, 
just about everyone they had. How would you characterize a typical mass meeting? A typical mass meeting was something that you probably needed to have witnessed yourself. That was that was singing, that was praying, and they the, they 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 sang in the manner that we we the old folk like the slaves. So then they moved it on up to where we are today in singing and the praying and the and the and the speaking and the teaching. Uh, you know, a lot of people <clears throat> uh, really don't understand that don't really have no knowledge if they weren't there of the role Ralph Abernathy playing in getting us ready for Dr. King. Abernathy could hold them there and, 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 and keep them and keep you not wanting to leave and stay and wait till Dr. King came to speak. The singing, you, you could really feel the spirit moving through. You could, you could just, they, you, I'm, it, it was, we, we did not do this that we, what has happened in Birmingham Alone, God. It was the work of God, and the more I think about it, the more I th and think about those meetings and how King showed real leadership. That was this. I remember one night. I think we were in 16th Street. There was this guy from the New York Times right? I was standing at the back, and uh, this guy was just looking at Dr. King, and he said, "Look at him. Just look at him. Just listen at him. He showed sh superb leadership skills." Because Dr. King was speaking extemporaneously, and everybody uh, referred everything to Dr. King. Even, however, we waited till Dr. King got there. He was our leader. And see, I hear black people tell you now, black folk don't need no love. But every group of people I know that exist got leaders. Every animal that I know, they have leaders. So I don't, I mean, but if you haven't been there, if you don't know, it, it, it makes a difference. Right. But. That was a that was a feeling. It was, it was it would it would go through you, you know, and then it would make the call for volunteers to go to jail the next day, you know. Well, did you participate in demonstrations? Yes. Yeah. How can just explain to, let me, to let me, people that will view this what what it was like being involved with the demonstration? Let me let me the, the first demonstration. Fred Shuttleworth led uh, to the. This, the federal courthouse steps on Fifth Avenue. And before we went down, we left A.J. Gaston Motel. And they told us, they said, now, they said, Joe, you get on one end. They said, Germany, you get on, John Henry Germany, you get on the front, and said, and, said, and they put somebody else in the middle. He said, now, when you get over there, when you get down there and you march down there on those steps down there, he said, these white folks are going to offer you everything and people are going to get up to leave. Say, try your best to keep them from leaving because we have to, get, we have to be arrested. What do you mean, offer you anything? Uh, well, you know, when we got there, when we, when we got there to the steps, uh, they, they let us march on. Before we got there, they kept saying, y'all go back. Y'all go back. Y'all go back down there. Now, these are policemen? They're policemen. Mm -hmm. And then when Boy Carter came, he was standing on the other side over there, by the, uh, over there where the treasury is, and he was telling us, they had one of the, one of the uh, captains to tell, tell us to go back, that, uh, that they would be they treat all right, and if we would go back now, nobody would be arrested, and uh, we just go on and forget about it. And so we kept telling them, don't stay, don't go, don't go, don't go, stay, don't go, don't go. So one or two people got up and left and went on. And so the rest of us stayed, and they said, we, 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 we pray, uh, Fred, Fred, Fred led us in prayer, Reverend Shelworth led us in prayer, and we stayed there, and we started singing and going, so uh, Bull said, uh, I'm, want, I'm asking you to leave. We're going to give you three minutes to leave. If you don't leave, I'm going to arrest every one of you. So we stayed there. Nobody left. And so Bull said, arrest them niggas. So they came, they came over there and arrested us. At the point in time, uh, I, wasn't, we, I wasn't thinking about being afraid that somebody was going to kill me. Uh, anybody, I, I wasn't. I wasn't thinking that they would do uh, anything like that at that time. I didn't. We just felt that, uh, and we picked the the federal step because really, at that point, we didn't we didn't think they were going to arrest us because we were on federal property. Well, Fred said, if you're on federal property, they won't arrest you. But they did just the opposite. They did arrest us, and we were on federal property. So. Uh, 
You know, we weren't thinking about it. We didn't think about any danger at that time. We didn't think about it. When was this? Was this in 63? This was in 62, I believe. Okay. You, if, you, if you can remember, we were doing, doing struggle with, with the whites while Dr. King was in Albany, Georgia. Mm -hmm. He had been, been down in St. Augustine or someplace, right. and everywhere he had gone uh, uh, in Albany, they would never do nothing but let them do what they wanted to do. So when, when we were here in Birmingham, uh, we had a different uh, individual, Mr. Connor. And uh, I don't blame it all on him. I blame it on the, on the power structure. The power structure here was different. They were determined to, to keep it as it was. And we were determined that we weren't going we to be in this. So uh, Fred was the leader. Fred Shelworth was the leader here. There was no NAACP. They had outlawed it. The Alabama Christian Movement was was, the, was the, the, the organ here. They had beaten Reverend Pfeiffer and uh, uh, Reverend uh, Billups and Mr. Armstrong and Fred with the chains at the school up there at Phillips and over at uh, Graymont. And, uh, and we had moved up to the, to the next level uh, was when we, we got involved in the demonstrations going downtown and the people from the lunch counter f were coming in and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the people were driving in on the, on the, with the, on the Freedom Riders and everything. So it was getting hot. I don't think anybody acted as bad as they acted in Mississippi and Alabama. Yeah. How many times were you arrested? I think, I think three. Mm -hmm. That time, when uh, on the steps, the first first arrest, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I don't know, uh, Mr. Gasson must know that I was over there because I was the first man. They let, he said Joe Dixon all the way, <laughs> and I didn't know what they were talking about. That meant then uh, you when they say all the way, that means that. You come out of the jail and go on. You can go. You, you can go out. You can walk out of the jail. Mm -hmm. They had keyboards in there that would tell you uh, what to do. They would, they, you know, look. They get you up in the morning. Jail. I don't know how people keep going to jail. They would get us up at at, at, at three o'clock. Then they get you up at four o'clock. Everybody eat at one time. The keyboard would tell you when to sit down and when to get up. And while we were in there, this is very interesting. interesting. They were so nice. That first group that, we, that they arrested, they were so nice. So Fred said, they're so, they too nice. He said, something wrong with these Birmingham police. They're too nice. And so we looked around and said, well, we, Fred said, we got to do something to make them, to show, to show who they really are. And uh, they looked around. There was a fan, big fan up at the top in, in the jail. And it was keeping up a lot of noise, a lot of noise. It wasn't putting out no cool air, but it was putting out a lot of noise. So... The guy, he has a, a, he does transmissions off of Bush Boulevard. Smith is his name. So Smith looked up and saw a loose brick, and we're gonna take the brick and put it in the fan to break the fan. I said, No, nah, bro. I said, Now look, you gotta realize this. No, we don't do that. I said, We in here for civil disobedience. We're not going to. I said, That's right. We aren't gonna be arrested for tearing up property. So we let that slide, and finally we got out of there and and, and went back. Then the next time, uh, I went to jail. Uh, I'm trying to think. What, 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 I don't know. What, what I know this. After the second time I went to jail, Mr. Piggies came out to Fairfield and told me. Well, they called out there after the first two times, the first time, and told me that uh, Dr. Gaston was in complete uh, uh, understanding of what we were trying to do, but the doctor, Mr. Gaston, also knows that. He said, when you get integrated with the white man you're going to have to have some money. And you're one of our best men. We want you selling insurance. We don't want you marching going to jail. So I went back again. The next time, Mr. Piggies came out there and told me, he said, Joe, the old man, is the old man put his money in. Mr. Piggies? Uh, uh, Clarence Piggies. He was the agency director. He said, old man put his money in, and he, he's, he's with us. But we have to have men who are working. And if we don't want you to go do it no more. Then came that Saturday when A.D. and, 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 and uh, John, uh, Reverend John Porter and, and all, all, all the people were going Smith, to jail. Dude. And Smith, and Reverend Smith, all of them going to jail. This was the Easter. Easter Sunday. I don't know if I was already in there or if I was there or if I went with them, but that was, that was, a, that was a time when I really understood what this movement was about and, and what the real deal was. I was sitting right next to Reverend Porter, and uh, they kept bringing folk in jail, bringing them to jail. 
They had all the preachers with the robes and things on. And I said to Reverend Port, I said, Reverend Port, I said, we losing this one. I said, we're going to lose. I said, what are we going to do? I said, they are mad with Dr. King. Tell me he broke, broke the injunction because he told us tomorrow they're going to put him in jail. You in here, Reverend Smith in here, A.D., Dr. King brothers in here. I said, we've lost this one. You know what Porter told me? Porter told me, he said, Joe, no, 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 no. We are not losing this one. We're not going to lose this one. He said, Martin is working from on high. He said, Martin is working, said, Martin is working from on high. He's not working from down here. And as I reflect back over the struggle and think about when we went uptown to get those kids out of Newberry, uh, up there, you know how kids were at. We, they asked us to come and get everybody to tear Newberry and Crests up. We went up there and got them. Fred had a white flag. And when we got with Fred, and we got to the. Wait a minute. Let, let me understand this now. You're saying that there were kids at Newberry's and Cresses who were demonstrating? Yes. Not on that day. But okay. This is another this day. This is another day. And the demonstrations were, were getting out of they hand. They got out of hand, right. Okay. They and, called down to 16th Street Church and said, come and get these children. We went up to get them. This is during the 63 demonstration. During the right. Okay. And when, when Fred got to the Carver Theater, the Birmingham Fire Department put a water hose on him, knocked him up against the Carver Theater, and he down, he got up with the white flag. They put it on again, and then some of the brothers who weren't participating told him, say, hey, look, don't put no water on Don't do, put no more water on him. And they didn't put any more water on him. Fred went on down to, got down to 16th Street Baptist Church, got all the children inside the, the church, and when he was going downstairs into the church, they put the water hose and knocked him down, and we thought they'd, they'd kill him. They took him to the hospital. So you're saying and, that this is, now this is, this is well known, the one where he was knocked off of the steps at, uh, at 16th Street, but you're saying even prior to prior that, to that water holes had been put had been, on him been put on at him. Carver Theater. At the Carver Theater, right, right that's right. And that's same that's the same day. Hmm. And then, you know, when I reflect back and I think, God had to have been in this. Uh then I remember that same day we brought those children from uptown, when we got down there where Helen Schultz Lee is about to do the job, we were on our come back Fifth Avenue, Fifth and, Avenue 16th and 16th Street. Or uh, we might have been up by the new gate where Freedom Manor is. Some black guys who had not been in the march attempted to get in the line like they were marching back with us. And a white policeman told them, to, don't you get in this line. A white policeman told them, don't you get in this line. You're not worthy. Get out of the way. Move back. Hmm. Then I knew then. Hmm. I knew then. After I talked to Reverend Porter, as I reflect hmm. back, hmm. that this isn't anything that we did. Hmm. Trust me. This had to have come from on high. It can't, it can't, Porter said, Martin is dealing from on high. Now, you were arrested at Easter Sunday, and you were placed into jail. How long did you spend in jail that time? I was out that Monday morning on my way to Tuskegee, Alabama. They had found a lady down there that could give me somewhere to stay, and the piggies told me to go down there and ride around and learn the debit. Ride us, ride around all that week. Don't do nothing. Don't say to nobody. Learn the debit and, and go on. They say you need. We don't. We don't. We, don't, we need you down there. We don't need you. <laughs> so they 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 got you out of town. Yes. So that so that you could do some work. So I could do some work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does how does this period in your life impact upon you your development later? Uh, I think that uh, having known, known Emory Jackson and having uh, uh, listened to him and believing in what he, what he, he was talking about, this, this same thing. Emory was a Morehouse man. Martin King was a Morehouse man, you know. And they uh, uh, were about to struggle. And I never shall forget uh, Emory said, and that's part of it, that a Morehouse man doesn't pay. A, a, a Morehouse man won't pay to be segregated. 
when in Atlanta they would go upstairs to the movie. And I think about how we fought so hard to change things. And in 1988, I was down there with the Hunt administration, and uh, the Birmingham War became uh, for sale. And we did say that, me and my wife said that they needed it, but I thought about Emma and I thought about all institutions, how we as a people always have to start over. We never keep going, we never move up, we move over. And I thought about all the stuff that we went, th we went through with, and to today, until I die, I will be fighting this with the same fierceness that I fought with uh, during those, from the 50s through the 60s and the 70s. Uh, because I'm a firm believer now, and I know that when you're at war, if you win the, win the victory, you have to occupy the land. When we won that victory in the 60s, we didn't occupy the land. So as a consequence, it's, a, it's still a strong fight. And what I learned from that struggle was that when they told us that nobody was interested in this but a few Negroes, and when, when other blacks were telling us this is a white man's world, and this is, you can't change it. And nigga, white folk gonna always rule. It, 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 it only charges the battery. It only, only makes me want to continue to fight because I firmly believe that this land is God's land, this land is our land, and we have to be respectful of each other. We have to treat each other, right? Because man is made in the image of God, and we should treat, treat each other as we treat, right. we want to be treated. Mr. Dixon, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule. What I would like to do, I would like for you to agree at some later date to come back, because we have a lot of territory to cover between 63 and 95, because you've been actively involved in any number of areas. Uh, we would very much like to, to have opportunity to sit down and talk with you about that as well. I'd be happy to come back. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Well, 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 well.